I feel like one of my favorite moments on the movie was when uh, it's a whole lineup and it's got me and Oscar and Timothy, I think Steven's there. I think that's it, but we're just, um, we're, um, I'm not sure what the, the area is called. We're just like basically in the, in the, in the, in the boardroom and Javier walks in and he looked like Mick Jagger. Like he just strutted in so cool and so just so much power. And he's such a beautiful person. Like he's completely available and there for you and, and the nicest family man, he's beautiful, beautiful. But he walked in with so much swagger and so much, just, he has it. That's a fucking Oscar, Oscar winner, <laughs> that's what it is. And, he, and uh, he walked in and just delivered it and just eyed down all of us. Thank God I was on his side and then we were friends. But it was beautiful to watch that man act. It was just like, I was in awe. I'm, I'm really thankful I didn't have to say too much because I was just like, <laughs> geeking out, smiling. I think, I hope in a good way that it's like, there isn't the orchestral, orchestral swell in this. And, and, if, and there will be swells, I'm sure, but it's, that's more for the second one. This is really like an on the run movie. This is a, a by any means necessary movie. And uh, uh, I would hope like there's just an understanding of the world and the beginning of the hero's journey that uh, is to come and an understanding of what the stakes are, why the stakes are as high as they are. And uh, that's where it's also a Denis Villeneuve picture, it's just sinking into another world that he'll make. And uh, it's thrilling as an audience member, that's why I love his movie so much. I think it was principally the book and then the character within it, within the book, but it was exciting to work on something that leans into a, not even commercial, but into a big feeling element and into a sci-fi universe that also has great respect in the literary community and is kind of like a stalwart of American fiction the way Watchmen and those older comic books are. Um, and then the role is just um, what an awesome opportunity to play someone lost, conflicted at a young age, but also with a messianic tendency, if I pronounced that correctly. Um, and uh, but one that he's unaware of, and that I liked uh, a lot. This idea of a conflicted, um, both morally and in action and in circumstance, uh, uh, young person in power, let's say. And if Jesus saved by saving people, Paul saves by killing people in some way. At least at the end of the first movie. And I thought that was a kind of a beautiful dichotomy, and rare to see as the lead. I've always been um, very interested in. Um, intrigued, I think, by sci-fi and sci-fi movies, and it's, I think it's really fun to kind of, I don't know, just, it's, there's something very, like, fun about just kind of escaping to literally another world and, and being in, a, in this different um, reality, and it's set in the future, and it's, you know, all these, all these different elements that kind of remind us of, of the real world and where we are now, but also are so, like, beyond anything we could imagine, and um, so being able to be a part of that this kind of, this um, I guess sci-fi world, is, it's exciting and it's, um, and it's fun and like really the possibilities are, you know, kind of endless. Denny's just, he's a, he's a god to me. I idolize him and I look up to him and, and all his movies and so um, that was what, and then I was baffled that he was doing Dune because obviously I'm a huge fan of all of his movies and so when he was doing Dune, super interested, knew what I was gonna play, called me up and um, and they told me Duncan Idaho and what he was, you know, because I hadn't seen the first Dune and I hadn't read the books. And so when he described it to me, and uh, you guys might have been recording, but I was pretty blown away. And uh, he just definitely needed someone that was like a knight, a very physical character who, you know, looks after, looks after the family. And I was honored to play the role. And Duncan seemed like a very, very loyal and honorable man. I was selling a film and I went into Legendary and it's a comedy with me and Peter Dinklage and, and they were laughing but then Mary Parent kept laughing and then going like this. And I was like, she's a weird chick. And, 
<laughs> and then she kept doing it, and I and, and I call uh, and they call this afterwards, and they said, "Look, so we're really interested in this this Peter Dinklage, you project." And I was like, "Yeah, why did she keep looking at me?" So and and it made sense after they said we had no, we did just didn't think of you and Dune. You know, we were we've been trying to cast this role. So long story short, they said, "Are you interested in doing this?" And immediately, there's a few directors. You know, especially after you've worked with them, and I've been lucky enough to work with good directors more than once, you go, I just, I want to do anything with that person. Like, I'm good. Like, it's called Dune. Yeah, I know Dune. Well, we'll send it to you. No, I don't need to read it. But I, I always think, nah, I should probably read it and just see how it is. And then it's this anomaly of a character. It's this great character. Well, the character, he's, is, Incredibly boring. It's just a normal bad guy, and he's uh, he has the he has one nuance, and that is bad. Um, what intrigued me was first of all, I wanted to work with Denise, uh, who is a very interesting filmmaker and who creates always creates a universe of his own. If you gave him enough physicality, you could create such a strong presence that he would sort of cast a shadow over the entire film which is necessary for a bad guy. Um, so that interested me. Well, the first thing that intrigued me was working with Denis again. Um, that was the big thing. I was familiar with uh, uh, the character somewhat, um, not completely um, familiar with them uh, in detail. Um, I had knowledge from this and that, from the novels and whatnot, but uh, didn't know so much about the character in particular until I was offered the role. And then I researched him, and I totally, I totally got it. But you know, the great thing about this was that Denny called me personally to offer me this role, which was uh, uh, kind of a, a big deal to me. You know, it's just, uh, as far as my career goes, and as far as my life goes, because I worked really hard to est establish myself as an actor, and to have uh, someone the caliber of Denny Villeneuve call me personally to offer me a role, like, it meant a lot. I choose Dune as my first English language feature because it's a good chance to work with Dini and this cast is so special. I'm also fascinated by the character Dr. Yue. Dr. Yue has served Atreides families for a long time and he became a traitor only because of his love for his wife. He suffered much despair in his life as a result, he's a complex and heartbreaking role for an actor to play. Dr. Kynes, uh, for me, is somebody who holds so much power in the palm of her hands in the form of secrets. And for me, when I was told about the, the character, looking up her up online, or Dr. Kynes up online, to find that this person on the surface was seemingly just judge of the change, somebody who's an ecologist, someone who cares about the Fremen. But then as you start to peel, as you excavate each little part of her nature, you start to understand how much she's holding and how much pressure she is actually under just to keep everything contained and controlled. And for me, I found that that was something that I would really like to get my teeth into. I wanted to take on the role because of Denis Villeneuve. I mean, getting to work with Denis is one of the great joys of being an actor. Um, so that was the first thing. And then I dove back into the source material and I started exploring and remembering what it was about Piter that was so horrifying and intriguing to me. And um, it's interesting. I love a challenge as an actor and Piter is definitely one of the most challenging characters I've ever played. I think what uh, intrigued me so much specifically about uh, this character, uh, Duke Leto Atreides, is uh, just the, the, the tragic nature of the character. I know that when I read the book, uh, there's this real build-up to meeting him for the first time, and you're hearing all these people uh, talking about his fate and, and that there's something kind of doomed about what he's walking into, what he's... Uh, bringing not only his family, but his people into by moving to, to Arrakis and leaving Caladan. So I, I thought there was something kind of incredible about the walking 
towards his fate, walking to his doom. And I think there's just something for me that just struck me as very human about that. You know, we're all, we all know we're walking to our demise eventually, and yet the, the, the beautiful spirit that comes out of that, what do you do, how do you face that? Well, I talked to the knee about it. There's many uh, resemblance on the Arabic culture, uh, starting with the, the author of the book and the Chakopsa language, which is the Fremen language. It's very based on in Arabic, in an Arabic uh, has an, an Arabic influence, and also Hebrew. And of course, the way they dress and the way they are explained in the book gives you a very, very detailed idea of where the basis of this character were coming from, which is the desert, the Tuareg, uh, the Bedouins, the, the people that leave, the nomads from the desert. So I, I just wanted to bring some of that essence of some of that music, some of that style and way of approaching the dialogue and, and the other into this character and then he thought it was a good idea and uh, that's what we're trying to achieve to bring some of that flavor into a person that when we see him we hopefully believe that he belongs to the desert and that he has belonged to this landscape for I delved in on, online um, because obviously the audiobook was there and I started with that. However, there is so much information online about this book. Um, the fans are so loyal. You have got people dedicated plus the work that Frank's done. I mean, there are so many essays, papers written. So you ask one question, you type one word in and you, you, you dive into this ocean which is the world of Dune and it's amazing how you could be there for <laughs> hours just swimming through through so much detailed information. Um, so I just did that and found my way. I, I also looked up, you know, I looked up politicians, I, I looked up ecologists, I, I did a lot of um, stuff with physicality, looking at people with their body language. Um, people within the military, just to get that sort of stature, a little bit of power going on. And, but um, yeah, the internet was my savior really. I didn't really have to go very far because there's so much information there. To prepare for the film, I went back and I looked at the original source material and I did a lot of studying on Mentats and what it means to be a Mentat. I thought a lot about a world without computers and I thought a lot about what purpose computers serve in our lives and how a human being could achieve that. It's a really huge idea if you think about how could a person emulate the functionality and the importance of a computer. Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about that. I also dove into some musical inspirations and uh, I studied the idea of um, pathological um, socio sociopathy, so sociopaths. Uh, Piter is in many regards devoid of that human emotion that um, made it really tricky for me to get into his skin and figure out how he operated. So I, I found that that like psychology research was really useful for me. If you have the full makeup, it's seven hours. And it's physically hard. Mentally, I can do it because it's fun watching them work. But 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 physically, uh, you have to sit still, straight for seven hours, and that's uh, that's uh, a really really bad flight seat on a transatlantic flight. <laughs> but then uh, you have layers and layers. The, the the big thing is, of course, the change of the face and the shoulders and all that. That is very very delicate. And then you have to have a fat suit on, you have to have a cooling vest on, and sometimes you have a harness on, and then you have the fat skin on, and then the edges between the skin and your fake hands and your fake head has to be hand-painted in, and it's, uh, it's a very complicated process. 
it was great because I had done martial arts a long time, you know, uh, I competed in, in Taekwondo and all that, so it was nice, it was a great regression. But then again, when you, you're in this place where you're like, okay, you're supposed to be tat, 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 and then you're thinking, God, I'm 51, and my knee hurts, and my, I'm not turning as well. <laughs> and then you're dealing with that, which I don't deal with that kind of stuff often, but I was dealing with it. Um, so I pushed myself very, very, very hard and which seems like an affectation when you're doing it and then or you know like a ego thing or I want to look good or I want to have a six pack kind of thing and that's not what it was interiorly I wanted to be in great shape kind of like I was for only the brave I was an interior interiorly I was in the best shape of my life you know so um, it took a while but uh, um, learning uh, kata fighting which was great um, with the sticks and getting and getting you know and filming myself and then looking at it and actually learning from it and saying oh I see I'm too far forward and I need to stand up more and and things clicking along the way. I looked at, at different leaders and the way that they talked, uh, people that I think we all find inspiring and people that we look up to and and the way that they you know the, the diplomatic aspects of what that is. Uh, I also watched a lot of Toshiro Mifune movies. <laughs> there was something about him that I just thought was, it's just such a powerful figure and uh, such a strong figure. And I, and so I liked that. And, and, and that was part of, you know, I, I remember I pushed for, I think you should have like a big beard and, you know, and I was like, maybe even do the top knot. We, we didn't end up winning with the top knot, but we got the beard. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you know, to you know, Denny's credit, he's just sweet. He's like, I can't imagine it any other way now. after having read the book, how they had condensed it, and uh, without giving anything away, the first movie certainly isn't the entire first book, and uh, it was just really impressive uh, how, um, from a plot point of view, they picked, they picked what seemed to be essential for the characters' characterization, but also to move the story forward. Uh, and secondly, I don't know what the right words, are, like gadgetry is not the right word, but like for all the uh, specific elements that fans of the book and uh, and uh, enthusiasts are, are really uh, passionate about it. I think Denis was very wise how to integrate those elements, which ones to integrate maybe in the second film, which ones to hit on the nose, which ones to allude to. I think I was instantly hooked and invested in the characters and I wanted to know what happened and where are they going and I wanted to understand the world, you know, because when you open it up, you're like, it's, it's very foreign and you don't know much about, you know, the literally the world that they live on and, and so you kind of have to learn all the all the um, I guess just all the words all the phrases all the um, the names of different things like I think all of us have, have struggled pr like properly pronouncing everything um, but it's um, I don't know it's just it's, it's exciting and it's interesting and it, and it unfolds in a in a um, a very exciting way and so I, I was I was lucky enough that you know even though I'm not in it throughout the time it's still very fun and exciting for me and kind of being able to pop in at the last minute and um, have some very special scenes that kind of set up what possibly could be in the future um, it's been really exciting it's beautiful I mean I, I come from a really sci-fi background um, in my career so I've done a lot of shows like um, like that and fantasy world and, and things like that so um, it was easy and I hadn't seen anything like this. And then w w what I got from Denis was that he gave the whole, 90 something pages of visuals that came with the script that were just, it was unbelievable. It's so beautiful. So um, that was exciting just to see that world. Cause I'm, I read it first without having looking, look, looked at that. And that was, um, it's always nice to have your own images come through, but there's no way you can beat him. It's just phenomenal. Before I read the script, I was expecting something very cyberpunk and outwardly. And after reading it, I discovered that this work of fiction is surprisingly accessible on a human level. Although the Dune universe is set in the future, there is a strong juxtaposition between the modern science fiction world and the daily battles that human face surrounding love, loyalty, and duty. I mean, we all deal with this in our lives. 
so we can all relate to the film. I was so impressed with how natural everything was. Um, because they're so human, these characters. And in a world where, you know, we're however many thousands of years in the future, it still adheres to everything that Frank had written in the first place, but it just makes it very present, very current to today. And that's what I love about it. It's, it all flies out of the mouth very easily. And so anybody watching it today is not gonna watch it and go, what did he say? There's none of that going on. I was really impressed by how, uh, um, how, how simple, in a way, they were able to, to distill it to. Because I think for, for Denis, the most important thing is the cinema, the cinematic aspects of it. And it's not a, a piece of literature anymore. It's, it's, it's a dreamscape. And so I, I think uh, it was distilled down to the essence of the story and of this family and of Paul's journey. Um, and I, 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 I think uh, they did an incredible job of distilling it down to the feeling, the feeling that you get when you read the book. Uh, I, I, I think it's very challenging to bring a book, imagination and such a uh, intrigued, intriguing uh, laces, uh, I'll, I'll start again. I think it's very challenging to bring the complexity of this book into one script. And I think they did a good job in bringing the most important, essential, and also crucial, but also uh, exciting moments of the novel into the script. So we have a great idea, a very uh, detailed idea about the, the, the writing of, of the author. Uh, and, and I think uh, the way Denis is going to do it is, is going to be very loyal to the idea. I only started reading the book uh, after I was approached to join the cast. And I enjoy science fiction because it takes us into a totally different world. I love the story. I love the Dune universe. I read Dune when I was in my late teens, and it was an incredible, profound science fiction uh, piece of literature that, you know, really had a great effect on me. But it's interesting how uh, literature changes over time, and so I went back um, to explore Frank Herbert's seminal work, and um, it's so incredible. I hope that I'll get a chance, I'll just read it again many times uh, throughout my life. It's an amazing piece of fiction. I read the first book many years ago and, and it had an impact on me for sure. Uh, there were things back then, I guess I read it in, in the 80s, that I didn't quite get. And that in this second reading that I did months ago, once I knew I was, I was going to shoot the movie, uh, I understood how powerful those things were, like the environmental, environmental aspect of it all, the social aspect, the political, the religious fanatism on, on how, how create fear and, and uh, legends in the people uh, in order to control them by religion. I mean, there are many things that are so right on <laughs> on what is going on today and especially the environmental aspect of it i think is very important to bring it on today and and i love the fact of portraying the character like paul is the uh the uh, is a young man he's the son of uh, duke leto and uh, lady jessica and uh he's he's a teenager let's say when we pick up with him in, in, in the film at least um, and the book he's 15 years old and uh, and he's launched on this hero's journey of sorts uh, that's beyond him where his uh, family is or his his, uh, his clan his, his people are the victim of uh, nothing short of a genocide and uh, he's forced to 
like I said, go on this hero's journey, and uh, at least in the first movie, it's more like an on-the-run movie. It's more like a thriller in some way, I guess. But then hopefully in the second one, gets uh, kicks some ass and takes some revenge. The Fremen people are people who are like native to um, to this planet, you know. Um, so they are very, very accustomed to dealing with. I mean, I guess the harsh conditions. They have their still suits, which you know um, help them retain their water, and um, they just have also you know very specific. I think rules and guidelines and rituals and things that they do that are that are you know their kind of personal culture out here in this desert and that's how they that's how they roll and so it's um i think it's cool i think it's cool to be kind of a part of this um this entirely new world um and kind of see how all of us even though like i literally am just meeting people and kind of we kind of somehow all fall into this like this group and this tribe which is really cool She has a sense of respect for him. I think when she first met him, she was like, mm, this, this boy, you know? Um, but now after this moment, um, there's, there's a, like a mutual respect there. And clearly something else, you know what I mean? There's a glimmer of something between them. And, um, and I guess we'll just have to see and watch that unfold. Well, they're an honorable people or prideful people. Um, they're the, the envy of the of some of the other planets in some way, or not the envy, but the other planets look to them for, for leadership and their honor and their straightforwardness and their, uh, and their valor. It's almost like a Spartan society, but I'd say minus like the fringe violent elements. And, uh, or not, not, not fringe, but the, the, the emphasis on a, a, a barbaric violence. But in every other way, it's, it's, a, it's a, proud, uh, a proud warrior culture. Um, and they've been, on, they've been on the home planet on Kaladin for a long time and they're forced to move uh, at the beginning of the film, go to Arrakis. And, uh, and the, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the strengths of the Atreides are, you know, relate to be their naivetes maybe and their weakness and their straight, and, and their honesty in some way, and in some ways they're taken advantage of by the Emperor, by the Imperial Order, by, by the Harkonnens. He's the nephew of, of, of the Baron, um, uh, Vladimir Harkonnen, and he is um, a very sadistic um, um, person. He's sadistic and and mean, and and not not the smartest guy. <laughs> I think you know he's not stupid by any means, but I think he relies on intimidation and fear, and he feeds off of that, and he thrives thrives off of that, and he also enjoys it. You know, I don't think he's a sociopath. A sociopath would, you know, wouldn't care either. You know, either way, wouldn't they? Don't really know the difference between right and wrong. He's us. He's he's a, a psycho. He's a psychopath. He knows the difference, and he he feeds off of of, of evil. He feeds off of fear. He feel, feeds off of pain. He likes you know, putting people in pain, and he's also uh, got a, a bit of a temper. <laughs> he's a, he's a, a vicious, sadistic person. He's an intelligent, emotional, complex man, and he's very conflicted because he has to find a way to save the Atreides kingdom and his wife. Peter de Vries is the Mentat uh, of the Harkonnen family, and uh, Mentat is a human computer. You know, computers have been banned in the world of Dune, in the world of the future, and. Um, so Piter has undergone extensive training and was bred and raised to be a computational device, basically, who can help its, his masters or whoever he's working with um, solving very complex problems. And those could be strategical problems, number problems, you name it, the things that we would think a computer could do. So Piter is a walking, living, breathing computer, but he's been twisted by the Baron Harkonnen, who is um, my master. And Baron um, has utilized the Sappho, which is derived from the spice, which is highly addictive, but also causes Mentats to function at the highest level. He's kind of strung Piter out on this, um, on this Sappho, and, and, and Piter um, is so devoted to this cause of retaining the Harkonnen control of the spice and retaining the Harkonnen control of Arrakis that 
when um, the Duke and the Atreides family arrive, uh, he immediately has been computing and figuring out the best way to undermine um, their arrival and to reinstate our Harkonnen house into power. Well, Stilgar is, is the leader of the Fremen, which is a tribe that lives in the desert in Arrakis, the planet that is also called Dune. And they've been persecuted and chased and uh, exterminated by the Harkonnen, which is the people in the power of this planet. They are kind of uh, the, the abandoned people and society that lives underneath the, the planet. And, and all they are looking for is to bring to this planet the greenery and the water and the environmental protection that the planet needs for them and for the future generations to be able to survive. And not only survive, but live with dignity. And so they do care about Earth. They do care about uh, the water, the sand, the rocks. They have a relationship with nature but also they have the need and they must fight for their own survivor, survival. So it's a great mixture between uh, a warrior, a fighter, and also uh, a thinker and a, and a captain, in the sense that he wants to create and organize a community that can bring this uh, future of the planet. The Reverend Mother is played by the incredible Charlotte Rampling, and um, <laughs> I know that's not the first thing that comes to mind. Some of that's maybe a fan of the book, but that was that's the strongest experience or relational experience in my head. And uh, she administers a Gom Jabbar test to Paul at the beginning to see if he's uh, truly, uh, truly the one in some ways. Uh, because if he was anything short, the pain would overcome him and he'd fail the test and die. Raban is not afraid of anything except for his uncle. He's, he's afraid of his uncle. Uh, which says a lot, you know. Um, but I think their relationship is, I think Raban really wants to please his uncle. And I think um, the Baron looks at Raban as more of a pawn, a pawn in his big game. Doesn't really feel much for him. They're, you know, they're related, but there's not, there's not a affection there. There's not love there. Um, it's, all, it's all business and professional. I think as far as the Baron goes, he treats Raban like that. Uh, but I think um, Raban is, you know, he's not only afraid of the Baron, but that's the one person I think he ad admires and he wants to please him. And he would, would, I think, do anything to please the Baron. I think it's a surreal experience. I think it's in some ways a young, a young man and a young person seeing you know, a romantic counterpart for the first time, like, you, like having that experience and uh, whatever part of that experience is shared or he wants to share and how much of it is just internal. And then secondly, it's this weird thing that I was just alluding to where the part of his, uh, his uh, prophesizing, you know, uh, his, his dreams that, are, that feel prophetic in some ways are starting to come true. And uh, in that moment, it's a beautiful thing because it has to do with the romance and love and first love and, uh, and a confirmation of uh, desire in some way, but on the other hand, it's very odd because uh, because um, that doesn't happen in life <laughs> to, to foresee the future. I was a big sci-fi guy. I was a big Ray Bradbury, Isaac Asimov guy, so I actually had read, I hadn't read it from beginning to end, but I had read major passages of it. And I love the absurdity factor, you know? Again, it's like, you know, Denis, I heard Denis say it the other day and I thought it was, I can usually find something descriptive that you know matches it or enhances something, and then he completely beat me to the punch. And he says it's it's sci-fi meets medieval, and I loved that. I thought that was extremely accurate, you know. And there's something very primal and kind of primitive about it, and yet it's sci-fi, and I just love that. I love the the anomaly of it. It's not very focused on, on the sort of the, the gadgets of the future, even if there are some incredibly interesting gadgets like still suits and thumpers and inventions by, by, uh, by the writer. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's it, to me, the more interesting things, as I said, is, is that it's uh, 
sci-fi culture or sci-fi cultures that reflect back on our Renaissance cultures and medieval culture. Um, the look will be different. It has that gravitas, which is the element of truth, human nature. And I think that's what makes Dune so special because it's not just a film about space. It's a film about people. It's a film about religion, faith. It's a film about ecology, environment, sustainability, what we do for our future, what we do about nurturing our, the people and the planet that we live on. And I think that's something that I hope people will take from the film when they go to see it, is how current and important it is and relevant to what's going on today. I've done my f fair share of spaceship films, and uh, and so there was a little part of me that when I was coming to this, I was like, all right, back in, back in space, more aliens, uh, and and from the moment I got on set, I realized, oh, this is this is a whole other thing. This is this is a dreamscape. This is this is surreal. This is uh, operatic, but in a in a in a Shakespearean kind of way. There's a, a gravity to the things that are happening. It is about the, it is about cultures and the clash of cultures throughout time on Earth. And it's a representation of that. And and family and a particular family and how it, how a child deals with coming into the world with parents that are struggling and trying and, and in a way all the adults around him are losing their minds and he has to find his way through and he has a special calling and he has a special purpose. Um, you know, I think there's some things that are just so uh, um, primal about about the film. And I, I, I think what Denis is doing, the way he's shooting it, it is it is pure cinema. I loved working with Rebecca Ferguson, and uh, it was an amazing experience. And uh, hadn't hadn't seen I've seen her movies once I started working with her, weirdly. But uh, but uh, Rebecca's just an excellent actress, and and fierce and strong, and uh, and uh, but that goes without saying in some ways, and uh, and very much like of the environment and style, both of Dune, but also I think of Denise's uh, way of shooting. My queen, Rebecca Ferguson. She has welcomed me to the fold, um, and I really do love her for that. She's, we haven't, the scenes that I've done with Rebecca, she hasn't spoken yet. So, um, and we, we haven't interacted with each other properly until we will be very soon, but, um, it, it doesn't even matter because even in the scenes that we're in together where she doesn't speak, she holds that power, that, that Benny Gesserit energy of being above it all, being behind it all, being underneath it, where I, my character states something, she says she's lying. It's just, I, I can't see all this happening, but even with what, just watching Rebecca's face, her facial expressions, I've gone, okay, I see what you're doing there. I see what you're doing. She's cool. She's a cool queen. She's classic, man. She's very old school in the best way. She's like, a, you know, Audrey Hepburn, or, you know, she's, she's just, uh, has so much gravity and so much um, pull, you know? You just, you just get sucked into to her energy and, uh, of course, um, so stunning. Uh, but um, but just has a, such um, a connection with the emotion of what's happening, and the emotion of the scene, and a, a very complex character that has so much. There's so much that's unsaid, and so uh, those those scenes that we had feel incredibly charged, uh, and I felt very connected to her. It was a dream come true working with Oscar Isaac. It's an actor I look up to tremendously. I've seen him in theater in New York growing up and a couple of plays and saw him Shakespeare in the Park as well. And uh, we did Hamlet and uh, The Most Violent Year and Ex Machina. And I was rehearsing a play in New York and the director, John Patrick Shanley, came in one day and he, Star Wars had just come out and he said, damn, there's nothing Oscar Isaac can't do. And he's in this big movie now. And that was very reassuring for me too. And obviously Denise's movies all have excellent actors. 
these are people that you see and you see and you just go, I mean, I'm sitting in an ornithopter with Oscar and, and Josh and they're, they're very funny human beings and they keep everything light, but at the same time to watch them just switch into gear and that seriousness and that, 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 that. For, for me with watching Oscar become this lovable Duke, just the heart. I, I've, I've really watched how he just fine tunes and, and um, displays that the, the care is not because obviously Kynes just thinks they're all barbarians you know they've just come to pillage and whatever but he's he's won me over as well with just there is a heart you can tell there's a good man in the Duke and and that's lovely to watch Oscar Isaac is someone I've been a fan of for so long now so it was really cool to get to meet him he's such a wonderful guy um you know we in our interactions what i was able to see is he was bringing this great uh, deal of dignity and complexity to this really wonderful and iconic character as the duke um and wonderfully for me when i get to interact with him he's been really uh decimated uh you know all of his hopes are dashed and for all that the duke knows his own family have been destroyed by us so that was fun to play because Oscar gave himself so completely to every moment that I was able to watch him on set uh, and so when he was in the depths of his despair he he was really convincing and um, it was it was beautiful I mean as, a, as, as an audience member it was sad to see you know him in that state but as Piter it was pretty cool I loved working with Josh Man, what a great guy, and um, I really like that guy. I don't know, I get a little choked up, but like he just, uh, he like wears it all on his sleeve, so like what a beautiful human being, and um, really just loves, lo loves it all. Lo loves, loves to love it and loves to hate it, and is, uh, and again, same thing, you brought like a, like a, a groundedness to all of it that, especially in that role, Gurney Halleck too, Paul and Gurney have a very, important and specific relationship that uh, he's got to be mentory, he's got to be kind of father figure, but he's got to, not, not totally, but he's kind of got to feel like a big bro too. And uh, and, and I, and bro specifically there, not brother, he's kind of, he's got to feel like, kind of like they're tight in some way. And uh, so it, it wasn't hard with Josh. What a, what a great guy. I wasn't expecting to connect with Josh Brolin as much as I did, to be honest. He, the first time I met Brolin was at an audition like 10 years ago, and he was a total asshole. And I, that's the first thing I told him about when I saw him, and and, uh, and he was very embarrassed and very ashamed. <laughs> and immediately, it was, a, it was a bromance from the start. <laughs> and then he kept teasing me throughout the thing. But no, he, uh, Josh, he's just, uh, well, he's an actor that I've respected and admired uh, since I started in this business and uh, someone I've looked up to and someone I get excited about seeing anything that they're in and knowing that really he's my right-hand man in this. And, and in, in a similar way, he, it's, it, it's that kind of relationship that allows someone that's supposed to be a, you know, a position of power or, or royalty or whatever, it's, it's the way that everyone around you responds and reacts that gives you that, that thing. It added a transformative quality, I think for everyone, I think for everyone, and uh, you know, to be shooting in uh, you know, the biblical origins of the world, uh, it added a seriousness again to what we were doing, um, misplaced or not, I think it helped everyone. Also to just be in seclusion with everyone and the conditions were pretty stark and when we came back to Hungary to shoot in studio, all of a sudden when you're talking about the desert or the impenetrability of the environment, it's not, a projection in your mind. It felt like what we what we experienced to some degree in Jordan. Not to say it wasn't lovely, and that when I rap, I think I'll probably even go back and go into Wadi Rum because there's a bunch of stuff I didn't get to do when I was there. I loved being in Jordan, just to be in that expansive the space, the the, the view, the picturesque. When you go to places like Wadi Rum and you go. My goodness gracious me, this exists. I've been sat in my flat in East London when I could be here. Just dunes and mountains as far as the eye can, can see. And, and then you think, 
how how long has this been here? How was this created? Such a beautiful place to be, and um, the crew and everybody else that we met we met along the way were just gorgeous, really. I was very intimidated uh, to go, and I, and I say that with pride because it's out of respect. You know, I really respect Stellan a lot. He's He's um, one of the most accomplished, uh, the best actors of our, our, our time. Um, I look up to him, I admire him, so it's a bit intimidating having, you know, getting to share scenes with him. But he was, uh, he's very gracious. He's not only very gracious, but I can tell that he's, he's a hard worker because of the makeup that he's had to put up with and <laughs> go through and still be able to perform. And I've never seen his uh, demeanor be anything other than pleasant and gracious and that says a lot. It was easy for me to play scenes with, uh, with, with Stellan as the Baron because I, as David, am so um, in awe of him and in like, oh my gosh. So as Piter, it was easy to be like, oh. Um, and he was the nicest, kindest gentleman. He was super sweet. He is so imposing in his makeup and his look. You know, the first time I saw him in his look was the first time I met him. So he reached through the steam and shook my hand and welcomed me to the set. And I was like, oh my God, oh, it's, it's incredible. Javier, um, again, obviously very talented person. Um, and he has, I think, a natural kind of presence and authority in a way even though he's super nice and like chill he also has like this when he speaks something about his voice is very like um strong and and demanding and i think that that's important for his his character obviously because he's kind of like the leader one of the leaders of our of our people so it's kind of like you know he needs that presence and that and that sense of authority um which he i mean does effortlessly and also this this also this language that he can like I remember when I was reading like how to pronounce, um, you know, our, our native language and I was just like, I don't know how to make this sound like, you know, right. But he just, I mean, comes out of him and it's beautiful and it's eloquent. I was like, okay, I'm going to have some work to do, you know. I have a bunch of man crushes on this movie. Like I feel like a little schoolgirl. I have a lot of man crushes. Brolin I've always had a man crush on. He's kind of like, I feel like my older brother. I, we're very similar, except for, you know, you know, he's a little bit older and has changed and is wiser and more intelligent. So, I mean, I feel like I'm gonna get there, like the, the bar's there. Um, Oscar, well, I was blown away. I was so blown away at how amazing and talented and just, uh, I mean, not even his acting, just, I think we're gonna be buddies for life, and it's a beautiful thing. Like I, when we were hanging out, I was like, man, I, I miss the guy. And I just, it just, that's, it's like when you first meet someone. I just, I, I really loved hanging out with Oscar. So we were, we're hanging out every night. Um, Javier was just legendary, legendary, and you know, um, got to meet his whole family, and they were just very, extremely beautiful. Well, Zendaya has this power that when she shows up, there's immediately a. Uh, an attraction towards her because, not only because of the way she looks, but the, the, the energy that she has. And she has this kind of, how to say, it, wild animal aspect on her that she's doing with the character that is very, very uh, appealing and that I totally buy that she is from the desert and she's been there trying to maneuver through the through the, yeah, through the rocks, through the sand, through the fight. Through, I think it's... Uh... I've been very lucky, like, in my life to work with great people, and, and somehow I just keep lucking out to be amongst people that are just, like, nice and, and kind people in real life as well. Um, I've been working uh, with Timothy for the past, like, you know, a few days, and I already feel like he's one of my best friends, you know? He, um, he's just a genuinely great, really great, funny, hilarious person. I think he's also very excited to have another fellow person his age on set, which has been cool, you know, so we can bond on that. Um, but um, no, he's, I mean, he's um, definitely um, all the way in, I think, when it comes to being in this, in this world um, and in this character. You know what's really special about watching Timothy? Um, 
He is, he's got it. He's just got it. He's gonna be up there winning many awards in his lifetime. Uh, he takes it very seriously, but he's such a beautiful soul to play around and have fun with. And it's time to work, it's, it's on. And he, uh, I don't know his process, but man, he becomes a character then it's beautiful and it's completely opposite of who Timothy is. So it's fun and I'm excited for people to see who he's really like. He brings a, a, a robust stillness to, to Paul. It's, it's this, even though he's flitting and floating from, from see, what is seemingly a, a naive little boy, the, with the questions he asks, the knowledge that is also there, it's just within him without him even realising, he flits between that seamlessly and it's just, it's just extraordinary to watch, it really is. Very excited to be working with him because he's so young. <laughs> but he's so blessed as well and it's, it's yeah, it's a beautiful actor, really, really um, in awe of him. He's a, such a great actor and completely committed and fun and uh, he has ease to him, but he's so intelligent and, um, and lacks vanity in a great way. You know, he's not afraid to, to play something behind the rhythm a little bit or to not be all knowing. You know, sometimes as an actor, you get something and you just wanna look like you're the smartest person in the room, the strongest person in the room, the, you know, the sexiest person in the room and, 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 and to have someone who, who allows himself to be young and not know and to be on the back foot sometimes and embraces it. And um, I've just been really uh, so, so impressed and, uh, and really um, grown such of an affection for him. And, and strangely enough, as, as, uh, as uh, you know, being someone that has a much, much, much younger son, but really felt a connection, uh, a paternal connection with him. Well, Timothy, He's 23 years old, if I'm not wrong, and I first saw him call me by your name, then I saw Beautiful Boy. He's a fantastic actor. He's really very uh, profound and deep and very much focused on the detail on creating all the reality that he has to create around him and with the relations, relationship with others. He's very focused and he's very, very well, very, very well trained. And it's a joy to work with. It's easy and also it's inspiring. And I think he's gonna do it. I love how Denise says to me once, it's either we make the movie we want and nobody sees it, or we make the movie we want and people see it. And to that point, like, I don't know how I got so lucky to be working on something this big, but it really has major indie sensibilities, and that doesn't mean like, a bunch of hippies behind the camera, although we also have a bunch of hippies behind the camera, but it means like, um, like it's just, uh, he's really like an artist, and uh, I mean that, I guess, in somewhat of a pretentious way, but also in that he's really like, you know, of, of, of his whim, of the moment, and, uh, and most of the time it's like, you know, it's really like a, like a genius at work, and, and he's also really humble. One thing he definitely said to me is, you know, within the Fremen people, there's no difference between man or woman. They, they fight the same, um, and they're both um, considered equal in that way as warriors. And so there's, um, there's definitely a strength to her, and I think in order to be a part of that group, you have to be very strong. In order to be accepted in that group, you have to be very strong. Um, and so she's seen a lot of things and had to deal with a lot. So I think she, there's, a, there's a certain strength and um, calmness about her. Um, and there's something obviously that she sees in Paul when she first meets him. And, and um, they have a moment that I think it, it, it kind of shakes her a little bit, which is like hard to do. It's just, it's like working with a, he knows exactly what he wants. He's got the images, he's had it in his, he's loved his book since he was 14. He's had this movie in his mind. This was like one of his dream, dream movies. And so I'm just trying to come and bring what I have and what I can do in my action and with my, whatever you call it, stance to play, to play Duncan. He's loving it, so I'm just doing my job. But 
you know, he has a, a very clear vision. He comes to you and uh, I just try to fulfill that because I mean, he definitely knows and it's beautiful. He knows exactly what he wants. So it's not really up for a lot of things. Like he knows it, you're casted right. And he just did fine, adjusts things. A director who really understands how to create the most creative set, the ambiance for people to be at their best, knowing that one per person is intrinsically different than another. So he's not just doing a blanketed ego thing. This is how I work, deal with it. He's going, what does that person need? What does that person need in order to get the best out of everybody? And then he'll ultimately create whatever he needs to, which I'm sure he knows better than anybody right now. He creates a universe of, of his own, but it's also his imagery that, that is unbelievably beautiful, but it's not beautiful as decor. It's beautiful for a purpose. It creates a beautiful, intense, very strange pressure on you as an audience, and you get sucked into it. Uh, and, uh, and that is, to me, what is fantastic about this film, that it will be different from, from the average films because it's, uh, it's made by a very auteur with a very distinct stamp of his own. Working with Denis in the past, I know that he will tell me who this character is. <laughs> so I didn't want to get, you know, uh, this preconception of who Urban was in my head before I had the, the talks with Denny because I knew he would have a vision. And so the first day that we came, it was for, uh, you know, uh, for costume fittings and makeup uh, tests. We, I talked to him about it and he wasn't quite sure either. <laughs> but this was the interesting thing he said to me and this is gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna ring in my head like forever. But he said, um, he, he looked, he looked very serious and he goes, let, uh, let me dream about it and I'll get back to you tomorrow. And I love that he said that, he's gonna have a dream about Raban. And he did, and the next day we came in and we started filming and we started to find who Raban was and he started, he liked, picked up certain things that I did and he said, I like when you do this, I like when you do that. <clears throat> so we kept it with those and we drew them out more. And, but that's, this is what I, why I love working with Denny. He's just, he's a performance director and that's, that's what I love. Denny and I, we met on the jury at Cannes Film Festival. Through discussing films, we found out that we have lots of things in common. When he asked me to, when he asked me to play the role of Dr. Yue, I was delighted. We're spoiled because he's just very gentle with everything that he does. Um, he allows us space to just be. Um, he allows us to play, and then he'll just come and fine tune here and there. He'll tweak, and he'll he'll very calmly just. There are times when you'll hear him, Madame, and, <laughs> which I love. You just hear this voice coming from, okay, yep, sure, sure. But uh, he's just easygoing and fun. And what, what, makes, what makes me giggle every time is that he, to see him with, with the others, just having a good old laugh between shots and takes, it just, it just makes it feel like family working with him. It really does. You don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like, because this is a man who everybody, as the minute I say I'm, I'm working with Denis, people are just, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, he's the, the, one of the best directors of our time. So for me to come from where I have come from, to be working with this man right now, it's a dream come true. And it's, it's a wonderful experience to have a nice, to have that nice spirit, just knowing that he's there on the other side of the camera and, and trusting when he comes and says, I love it, I love it. So yeah, you just want to please him the whole time. There's no other person to make this film than Denny. I mean, he is the master of telling these incredibly complex stories. He's the master of, of, of finding all the different sides of characters and all the different sides of relationships between characters and bringing them to the film uh, in really effortless ways so that as an audience you can really get lost in the story and yet still 
never feel like it's been dumbed down for you. He takes it to that level and he has this eye for everything in regards to the language of cinema. And um, he's truly a master. I mean, he's truly a genius. And I love, I love that he dreams big. I love that his vision for films like this film are limitless. Like when he dreams and when he imagines in the places that his his mind goes, um, it's limitless. And you take all of that and you look at the landscape that he's creating and this world that he's creating and the, 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 the incredible leadership that he brings to you as an actor and getting you to go places you never thought you could go. And you step back from all of that and you realize that he's also just one of the kindest uh, humans that you've ever met. Um, then you go, wow, that's, and it's no wonder that at the, at the heart of this very cool, very uh, fun, very crazy film is also going to be a, a great deal of heart. And that all comes from Denny. I actually wrote to Denny a few years ago when I first heard that this was happening. And I wrote to him just saying, I love Dune. I love this book. Just letting you know, just throwing it out there. And then he wrote back, you love Dune. Interesting, dot, 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 <laughs> good to know. And so, so years later when he comes around and he says, I, you know, I, I want you to be a part of this, I was incredibly excited. I just think nobody's making movies the way this man does. Uh, these huge, deep, artful, beautiful, poetic movies on a mass. Well, the first time I met Denis was in, on a lunch and I said to him uh, how much I would love to work with him. And he said, well, there might be a project that I'm thinking of, and I didn't know it was Dune. So after a month, he called me and I couldn't believe that it was Dune with him, with this amazing cast, and playing Stilgar, which is a character that back then when I first read the book, it had an impact on me. And it's like the character of Aragorn in The Lord of the Rings. It's one of those characters that when you are a young boy reading, he's like, wow. What a great character to portray or to play, even in your own privacy, no? <laughs> when nobody looks at you, like in your room. <sighs> and uh... Denny is another incredibly kind person. I mean, it's like <laughs> he was saying, like, I mean, um, the first day that I was there, because I think there's so many elements that he has to work with. I mean, he has to think about light and wind and, you know, um, background and character and this and that like there's so many elements and a million questions being asked and he handles everything so calmly and so kind and just like patient and you know um and that's like very hard to do me if i were in that situation and like there was a million things going on at once and i have to work with the natural light and rocks and sand and you know a lot of elements I would be freaking out <laughs> you know but he handles it so well um, and still somehow keeps track of every character every moment and and never loses that he is extremely alive on the set and that is as an actor that's wonderful because because you want the process on the set to be uh, a creative process. You don't want it to be like filling in the colors in some, something that has already been designed. Uh, and he's, he's, uh, he's very nice to everybody and he listens to everybody and he makes his own decisions of course, but he listens to everybody and the atmosphere on the set is one of the friendliest uh, I've been to. Uh, it's, it's uh, non-hierarchical, it's very, very, very open. And it's wonder, his enthusiasm, I mean, his childish enthusiasm when he sees an image that he likes, when he almost jumps up and down behind, behind the monitor and he says, okay, I made him happy. <laughs> That's very nice. 
I found Denis to be one of the best collaborators I've ever worked with because we immediately started talking about the scenes and talking about the book and I, I would always go back to the book and you know I, I could, there, was, there was this refrain that I'd come back every day you know to set and be like but you know in the book and he's like oh here it comes and uh, and but he was always incredibly open to to a lot of these things and open to exploring it further and to not making him just someone that stares off into the middle distance and says profound things but but actually a real father a real human being and, and in some ways, the most human out of the characters that are there, because he's not a messiah in training, he's not a, a, a Bene Gesserit, he's not a Mentat, he doesn't have superpowers. Uh, he's dealing with very practical, very real things at all times. And so, so that was a very important thing for us to really nail down, and also that, that the audience has to feel some sort of complicity with him, some, some sense of uh, connection with this character in the way that Paul does as well, uh, I think in order for Paul's journey to really um, really take hold and for you to, to feel what he feels at the end of the film, it was important to create a character that you really felt was the person that was holding this family together. Denis is one of those directors that when I saw his movies I always dreamed of working with, but. As an actor, you never know. He's like, yeah, well, I don't think that will ever happen. Well, it happened. <laughs> so I'm pinching myself every day. Because, and what is most important, beyond that, which is his, it's, uh, his undeniable quality as a director and filmmaker and a storyteller, he's a great human being. He's a very nice, warming, caring, funny, intelligent person that makes everybody feel comfortable, secure, safe, and also reminding them the joy of why we... Denis was very much more interested in what I thought about the character. Um, and we talked about her power. We talked about the fact that she was holding a lot of information that if for example, she wanted to, she, it could be a ticking time bomb in a sense. And we talked about her passion and we really concentrated on that, her love for, of her people and the land that she lives on. And of course, Shai Hulud. So the seriousness of who she is juxtaposed with the passion and the loyalty as well to the Fremen and to what she does as an ecologist trying to change the whole system and rebalance and bring equilibrium back to Arrakis. I feel like one of my favorite moments on the movie was when uh, it's a whole lineup and it's got me and Oscar and Timothy, I think Steven's there. I think that's it, but we're just, um, we're, um, uh, I'm not sure what the, the area is called. We're just like basically in the in the in the in the boardroom, and Javier walks in, and he looked like Mick Jagger. Like he just strutted in, so cool, and so just so much power. And he's such a beautiful person. Like he's completely available and there for you, and, and the nicest family man. He's beautiful, beautiful. But he walked in with so much swagger and so much just. He has it. That's a fucking Oscar, Oscar winner. <laughs> That's what it is. And, he, and uh, he walked in and just delivered it and just eyed down all of us. Thank God I was on his side and that we were friends. But it was beautiful to watch that man act. It was just like I was in awe. I'm, I'm really thankful I didn't have to say too much because I was just like <laughs> geeking out, smiling. And it was great to get into this because this is a very different vernacular in itself. But I was already, I had already been through that panic. So I was like, oh yeah, I like doing this. This is something that I actually love doing. It's its own language. And you know, even Denis brought a linguistics guy in and created a totally specific uh, language to, to, to this movie. I mean, when they do, when they do, um, I think it's um, Oscar and, and, and Rebecca do a little uh, sign language. It's actually based on a language that's been created for this movie. So everything they're doing is an actual dialogue based on a language that doesn't exist except for in this film. That's pretty cool. I like the specificity of that, you know?
the set designs and, and, and the costumes are aesthetically unbelievable. The size of the sets, I've never seen anything like it. It's uh, overwhelming. And then you know, the Greg's, the way Greg shoots them and the light he puts into them and a lot of side lights and darkness, uh, uh, Caravaggio blackness, and uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be spectacular to watch. The set designs are amazing. We were actually walking around the stage the other day and just couldn't believe how massive they were. Because a lot of times, especially you know today, I mean, they're just doing so much with green screen. Everything is green screen. But there were so many large practical sets here. It's really, it's really amazing to see. But also, as a performer, it's it's a luxury, you know, to have that to be able to, you know, to have that that vision and not so much rely on your imagination. You can you're thrown in this world. You can be in this world. You can put yourself in this world. Look around and you not be taken out of it because you're not looking at a big green screen. I got to Budapest and I got into, you know, uh, hair and makeup and I started shooting my first day here and, and I walked onto the stages and I just, my jaw dropped. And I was like, are you kidding me? This is, it's like, it's like when you've read a book and you, you've imagined what something might look like and then you actually see it coming to life, someone's building it. I've never had an experience like that before brought so profoundly to, uh, to life and yet it even exceeded what I had imagined. And, um, and so I was just seeing one set, I was seeing a big cool part of what is, you know, in the Harkonnen um, house. And then uh, one of our producers, the executive producer, Tanya, took me for a little walk. She was like, do you want to go see some of the other sets? I was like, yeah, yeah. So we went to see the dining room and we went to see some of the... And I just, I mean, I'm not surprised because I do think, you know, Patrice is one of the greats, but, um, it was, it was amazing. We're talking about a resource that you can only get on Arrakis. We're talking about something you can make paper out of, you can make uh, essence out of, you can, there are gases that you can have. There are so many things that you can make from this one source, spice. It's rich, it's a commodity. Everybody wants the stuff. How do you get it? Where does it come from? And what happens if you can't get it anymore? <laughs> and so everybody's come to this place to get this thing, but we have to, we have to look at it in, in, in the true sense. The spice, with, without the spice, the spice comes from the sandworm. No sandworm, no spice. Then you ask the question, what is most important to the people of Arrakis and, and the Fremen and to Dr. Kynes? Is it the spice? Nah. Is it the sandworm? Maybe. But this cycle, this life cycle that is the sandworm, without it, no spice. People want this thing all over the universe. You've got these incredible uh, different groups, the, the Bene Gesserit, the Mentats, the Spacing Guild, and they all have these incredible um, powers that have been unleashed by, their, by the spice and what it does, to, how it expands their consciousness and what it allows them to see. And so that's been the driving force that has allowed for the evolution of these people to, to do these incredible things. And so, and because it's only found in this, on this one planet, in this corner of the universe, um, that's why it's so rare and special and sacred. I think a spice to the doom world is like oil to the modern world. It's like that thing that everybody fights and kills for. And without it, the world kind of will stop. And that's what creates nations to fight against each other and invade each other and create this uh, horrible environment of war all around us. Spice is not different. Spice is that thing that belongs to Dune, a rocky planet, that all the planets and societies around us wants to put. I think, I hope in a good way that it's like, 
there isn't the orchestral orchestral swell in this, and and if, and there will be swells, I'm sure, but it's that's more for the second one. This is really like an on the run movie. This is a, a by any means necessary movie, and uh, uh, I would hope like there's just an understanding of the world and the beginning of the hero's journey that uh, is to come, and an understanding of what the stakes are, why the stakes are as high as they are. And uh, that's where it's also a Denis Villeneuve picture, it's just sinking into another world that he'll make. And uh, that's thrilling as an audience member, that's why I love his movie so much. You want to not be able to turn it off. You want it to be fresh. You want it to be a movie that allows you to dive into a world that you're not used to and like swimming around in that world. You know, you invest in people. And what I think Denis does better than most is he, he understands scope. He's able to encapsulate scope and just go, we, can, we, ha we, we are totally responsible for this. It's not gonna get out of our hands and do this, you know, become its own thing. Like we know what we're doing, but within that, you will be able to invest in every character that I present to you in whatever way. And so it feels like a smaller movie emotionally but then you have the scope of a massive, you know, uh, sci-fi. When I read the book, I took away a lot of different thoughts and feelings. And of course, you, you always want them to have uh, a fantastic and unusual time in the cinema, something they haven't experienced, and I hope that they see something they didn't expect to see. For me, as, as an actor, I always hope first and foremost that people are entertained. Um, but I think they're going to get really drawn in, uh, I think, to the, the stories. I mean, it's, it's very, they're very, very political. There's a lot going on in this film. <laughs> There's a lot of underlying messages in this film. It's a very, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's families and it's tragedies and it's, uh, it's politics. Um, but also, you know, I think the performances, people are really going to be sucked in. And the great thing about films like this is it's a really an, an amazing thing for people who have grown up um, attached to these novels and loved with, in love with these novels, obsessed with these novels, and see them be brought to life. I think that's what they're going to be thrilled with the most, is that these characters are being brought to life by another fan. I'm really excited for audiences to see this movie. I can't wait. Um, I'm excited for me to get to, you know, take people and share it with people because I think they're going to, you know, have their eyes open and their jaws are going to drop and their minds are going to be blown. But at the end of the day, their hearts are also going to be incredibly, um, you know, touched by these incredible characters, this incredible story and these amazing performers. Thank you.